Hello, everyone, and welcome to Conversations with Changing Streams. My name is John Fitzgerald, standing in for the wonderful Brendan Kenny, who is away today. Changing Streams is a community interest company working in partnership with the University of Liverpool, committed to the reduction of plastic in the construction industry. Our topic today is plastic in architecture and design. And we are fortunate indeed to have a very well-informed panel to help us unpack this subject a little bit. We have an architect, we have a house builder, we have an entrepreneur, and we have someone who is passionate about addressing climate change. So quite the lineup. Let me start with brief introductions to our panelists. Talene Josephson is a US registered architect and passive house consultant based in London. And she promotes healthy, low energy architectural solutions that strengthen local communities, economies, and biodiversity. Her work includes research and analysis of building material reuse as a method for reducing the industry's negative environmental impact. She works as a Thrive project manager at Chetwoods Architects, advising on sustainable and circular practice and its implementation. Rachel Lockery from the Irish Green Building Council is working in the area of circularity in buildings. She has 10 years of experience in the construction sector with a degree in architectural design, a master's in architecture, and a diploma in retrofitting, sustainability, and conservation. She is highly passionate about mitigating climate change and is a member of a number of environmental groups, such as ACAN Ireland and Antoshka's Climate Ambassador Program. Jamie Blenner Hassett is a managing director of Hassett Homes in Liverpool. Hassett Homes build contemporary homes with a traditional twist. They are bright and airy with plenty of space and light. They use high quality finishes, fixtures and fittings, as well as providing a high specification of standard. They pay attention to every single detail within their homes from paint colors to sustainable energy features. Patrick Folks has focused his career on a range of financial and entrepreneurial activities. Many years ago, he was involved in derivatives and gold bullion market making in London and New York. In 2016, he founded the Graphene Company, trading as Graphene Stone Paint UK with its innovative range of sustainable, healthy, and high-tech ecological coatings that are air purifying and free of plastics. So welcome to you all, and let's get started with a question. So my first question, as sustainability gains increasing importance within the construction sector and more widely in society in general, in what areas of architecture and design can or should plastic be replaced? So let's go to Talene on this first, please. Sure. Um, I mean, I have a few specific examples, um, although I would like to try to design out plastic as much as possible out of buildings overall. I, there are very few things where I think we really need to have plastic. The one thing that is a bit difficult to find a good solution for um, in the same way that we're having trouble finding a good solution for concrete is in foundations below ground, especially if they're occupiable. So um, to ensure that there's not water penetration and um, moisture penetration into those underground spaces is quite difficult. Um, although there are some options, there are not like if you're doing a larger scale building, it becomes very difficult. Um, however, one thing that I would like to mention specifically is the designing out of plastics and plumbing. Um, I don't know if you're all familiar with the Healthy Materials Lab and their very excellent um, Trace Materials podcast, but I just finished binging it actually. Um, one of the things that they discussed were the dangers of PVC piping and just general plastics and piping. They caused all kinds of endocrine disrupting issues. But then as we've seen recently um, with the fires in Western the US, they also cause um, extremely terrible side effects uh, if those plastics are burnt in addition to their use case, uh, which have then poisoned waters um, after fires and also 
directly cause uh, preeclampsia and other preterm birth conditions in pregnant women if then inhaled through uh, plastic smoke. So there are all kinds of issues, but yeah, specifically like to harp on plas removing plastics from our plumbing because that's something we actually ingest every day. Well, let's go to Jamie then on this point because Jamie, you're at the sharp edge of this in your role as managing director of Blennerhassett Homes. So what are your thoughts? Um, I would uh, echo what Talim was saying about the um, the plastics in plumbing. That's an easy one to replace. Obviously, we used to use copper pipes uh, historically. Uh, there's obviously a fine balance of costs, uh, but at the end of the day, if, if it, it, it's very easy to remove and swap out uh, with, with copper. Uh, there's other things like PVC windows, which can easily be replaced with timber windows. I know you can get aluminium, but I'm probably more in favour of uh, high quality timber window frames. Um, and there's lots of other stuff like uh, PVC rainwater goods as well, which can be replaced. Um, but also you can, you can remove the plastics, but you also need to look at the overall sustainability effect in terms of the likes of aluminium has, I believe, a much higher uh, emissions rate for every kilogram produced compared to plastic. So it's a fine balancing act between many things. Uh, but I do believe that there's a lot of alternative materials out there, uh, especially for houses and high rise buildings and commercial buildings, very different, but especially in residential house building in the UK, uh, there's a lot that can be done today, uh, as long as it's balanced with costs and also viability. But one thing that's very easy is in terms of the packaging, the building materials, there's lots of plastic packaging and building materials, which can be, re which can be replaced pretty much instantly. I'll give you an example. If you go into Tesco supermarket, you'll notice that the Heinz beans used to be wrapped in plastic packaging, but it's now in a, a paper uh, sort of box. Very easy swap out, and that's something we can actually do today in construction, just as long as we get suppliers uh, on board with that. Rachel, what are your thoughts on, on this, given your background and your interest in circularity in buildings? Apologies, guys, on this. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, the obvious kind of answers would probably be insulation. Um, we're looking at plastic, kind of like the waste that I see when I'm working as an architect on site, because I work um, as a freelance architect as well. And a lot of waste comes from ducting. Um, and there's a, an organization called Gator Duct, and they use, um, it's called Triwall um, Cardboard Ducting now, instead of using plastic and metal. So that's very interesting. I feel like that's something that definitely could be pushed forward more. Um, I'd also hone in on the plastic packaging as well, because I feel like um, I see so much waste on site of plastic packaging and how, like looking at alternatives, there's so many alternatives to packaging now, because it's definitely been a lot more developed than um, products in the construction industry. So I feel like that's definitely um, an easy win um, to obtain. And Patrick, you're also at the sharp edge of this producing products that are actually being used in the marketplace. What are your thoughts on this? Yes, uh, uh, great to be on the, in this conversation. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so, so paint, I mean, let's talk about that one because it's such an important issue, in fact. I mean, paints uh, from some recent research that came out last month, uh, quoted in Forbes, uh, confirmed that some 58% of all the microplastics in the oceans come from paint. 58%, that's 1.9 million tonnes a year. Uh, year on year, it's a pretty terrifying number. So, so what better place to start an industry which is, you know, uh, uh, ra ra really ready for change? I mean, cosmetics, uh, which used one sixth of the number of microbeads, they've banned them, and yet paints, for some reason, continues unabated. So, you know, it's a, an industry deeply toxic in production. Uh, again, at point of use where after painting your VOC levels can go up a thousand times. Uh, and finally, of course, when those products die out on walls and, uh, and uh, uh, internally, externally on ships and uh, many, many other areas of uh, which get painted. So, so paints, definitely worth a closer look. So VOCs, volatile organic compounds, you mentioned there. Tell us a little bit more about those, Patrick, please. Well, most paints are derivatives of crude oil. About 70% of the 10 billion litres of paints that get produced every year are heavy, uh, are solvent-based with heavy amounts of VOCs. Uh, these are the 
off gases, these are the, the light chemical fumes that are released, not just during the drying and curing process, but for months and years afterwards, that have such a major impact on indoor air quality. And so, so these, these are, you know, a, a, a factor of an industry that's been, the, you know, very much um, the number one choice, plastic paints over the last 50, 60 years. And that's mainly because there haven't really been any new technologies to come in to replace that durability and strength that you get with plastic. But that's now changing. And there's new technologies around like graphene, which is an amazing story in itself. Hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that, um, which have, you know, developed very recently, literally in the last decade or so, and are offering new, new alternatives to plastic paint. So... Uh... Jamie, you touched on some of the alternatives that can be used instead of plastic. Um, so can you develop that a little bit for us? And then I'll go to the rest of the panel. But starting with you, Jamie, some other examples where you're seeing sustainable alternatives and switching out is the term that you used. Could you embellish that a little bit for us to, to give us additional uh, ideas for, for where substitution can easily take place? Yeah, I mean, um, just a little bit of a, a backstory. We're at Hassel Towns, we're working on a true uh, carbon zero house type range at the moment. Uh, and it's not a very easy task, but we hope to be uh, bringing it to the market in the next 12 to 18 months. But uh, like anything in life, everything you do has a cause, uh, is a cause and effect. Uh, so every time we swap something out, uh, you bring something else in and it can, it can play a part in, in, in elsewhere. But in terms of the likes of insulation as well, uh, insulation is great, uh, but if you don't have, um, if, if your house is not airtight, uh, then uh, to some extent your, your insulation can be quite useless as well. So when we're designing these homes, we're trying to get the airtightness uh, as high as possible. So actually we may not need as, as much thickness of insulation uh, around the walls. So in that itself, if we reduce insulation by half, then in theory you could say we've reduced the impact by half on that element. But it's also looking at other, uh, it's uh, looking at other uh, materials to replace that uh, and different fibers and the likes. Um, I don't know the exact ones we're, we're looking at at the moment in terms of insulation, because um, I'm just a house builder, I'm not the expert in all these materials. Um, but it's an accumulation of things. Uh, there's a lot out there at the moment which we can use. Um, and I think we should try and work with what we've got as well. Like, for example, uh, instead of using block, uh, we're looking to use more timber, but a more sort of like cross-laminate timber, which is uh, extremely sustainable compared to the likes of block. Um, so it's a, a huge accumulation of things, and we're not going to get it perfect from day one. Uh, I think it would be like anything in life, we will innovate uh, and grow on that over time. And the little bits we can't swap out, uh, hopefully over the next five or ten years, we'll find more innovative products to, to swap them out over time. So I'd, I'd like to come to you now, Rachel, and just build on this question a little bit, because we're, we're starting to now see uh, uh, materials like hemp, mycelium, cork, food waste, uh, even bamboo being developed into materials. So where are companies up to with the development and deployment of, of these new types of products into industry? Um, well, like in large scale industry, I can only speak from an Irish perspective. Um, they're not used heavily, but in small kind of projects, like kind of self-built projects, they've been used for years and years and years. Like um, two weeks ago, I was in Clare building a tiny house and they're using cork insulation and focusing on natural materials. That was a very small scale project. Um, I suppose for me, I see um, a lack of education about these materials and a lack of knowledge. I think that's a really big factor. And um, in the Irish Green Building Council, I'd you know, run workshops with these kind of large de developers and architecture firms and engineering firms. And um, when I'm going through circularity and through um, biological materials, um, there's just a lack of, a lack of awareness um, because these materials are incredible. Like looking at it, like even mycelium, like the amazing insulative properties of it, um, especially you know, sheep's wool in Ireland, we have a ton of sheep, but the wool is generally just thrown away. Um, because we don't have processing plans for it here. Um, so yeah, we kind of need to start bringing it, and I think there's just needs to be more awareness brought into the table. Um, so hopefully that's kind of pushing forward now with the circular, circular economy bill that came in to Ireland yesterday and 
with all the circular initiatives that are coming through um, Europe at the moment. Um, so fingers crossed, um, change is happening. Uh, Rachel, just for, for my own education, I believe mycelium is a, a, a byproduct of mushroom farming. Is that correct? Yeah, it's like the roots of um, the mushrooms. So it has, a, yeah, it's an incredible material. Um, I feel like that's a whole, <laughs> a whole other webinar in itself. <laughs> I think um, it is. I, I believe yeah. <laughs> it's also very uh, fire retardant as well, which uh, means it's it's very effective for, for building purposes. Talene, exactly. what, what are your thoughts on some of those materials, whether it's cork or bamboo or myce mycelium? What are you seeing from your perspective? I'm a huge proponent of all those materials. Um, I think one thing just to mention before, because I actually have a list of all kinds of ones that are available on the market now or are just about to be, so I can probably list them off for any listeners. Um, but we need to make sure that we're looking to local production and local availability so that we're also reducing the embodied carbon from transport and also um, bringing up our local communities and our local economies. We don't want to be ordering something from uh, across the world, like say in China or the Western US, when actually there could be a better alternative closer uh, nearby so that we're meeting all of the needs that we need to meet. Um, but in terms of the materials that are available now, there are quite a number. Um, just one big one is um, the Stico products that have a huge range of cellulose construction products. Um, many of them, which could replace a lot of plastic products, um, improve air tightness with some of their, um, like, uh, yeah, I think, can't remember what it's called. Some of their boards help improve air tightness. Um, they have all kinds of insulation, membranes, et cetera. Um, they're great alternatives that are on the market at scale now, so anyone can use them. Um, then for mycelium uh, products, there is going to be a new building insulation panel that's coming into market soon. That's being developed by Biome, in, which is a London-based company. And that same company, which is developing these insulation panels, which are like prefab, um, they're also creating a deconstructible cladding system also based from waste and bio-based products. Um, then if we look to cork, lots of materials available on the market. There's cork insulation, cork floor. I think the main one is corka that we've been um, specifying on our projects. Um, and then for hemp, there are so many products and it's just increasing. Um, in the UK alone, the UK Hempcrete company, they produce prefabricated hempcrete blocks in addition to in situ hempcrete. Um, Indie Nature is currently um, developing their own production facility in Scotland, I believe. So not only will be UK grown hemp for bat insulation, but also UK manufactured. So a very local product, improving the agriculture industry here, supporting them, um, similarly to what we need to do for sheep's wool. Um, and then also Steve Barron's Margent Farm, they've created a company out of their work there. I don't know if you're all familiar with that really beautiful project. They have done a beautiful like hemp cladding. It's like a corrugated hemp cladding and then as well as hempcrete panels. Um, but they are currently working on um, some research that's going to be available on market in 2022 and 2023. So the cladding should be available on market in 2023 and a multi-density hemp fiber insulation with hemp and as well as hempcrete will be available at the end of this year. So tons of products. It's just a question of finding them, um, but there's so many alternatives out there at scale on the market that we can buy right now. So Patrick, picking up a, a couple of points there, one from uh, Talene, one from Rachel. Yeah, uh, Rachel talked about the education and the awareness uh, about some of these alternatives. Talene highlighted a veritable menu of wonderful options. How do we get a shift in the marketplace and raise the level of awareness about this and educate people a bit more effectively so that the uptake for these new materials actually starts to accelerate. Yes, I mean, uh, as you say, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, events like this, I guess, which help to, to spread the word. And uh, you, you know, you've got a long history of traditional building materials, very carbon intensive, very little development of new, new ideas and you've also got challenges. You know, one of the things that I've picked up on reading the, some of the ACAN uh, uh, messages is that just simple things like insurance, buildings insurance, making sure that using these materials can be achieved and actually put into practice because of some of those things that just are hard to find. 
So, um, so I think it's education. I'm sure there's a huge opportunity for an insurance company who would come to the market with a, a series of, of insurance products de dedicated to these new things would be potentially very good business. I'm surprised that somebody's not already uh, on it. Mm. Um, so as you say, awareness, education, uh, and, uh, and shouting about it. In our case, in, you know, graphene, you know, this is, a, this is a, an amazing development from some guys at Manchester University who are now Nobel Prize winners for their discovery. And they basically allowed us to convert mineral paints being used for millennia, trusted, lovely stuff from like lime and silicates and so on, but never very strong, uh, was a bit brittle uh, and soft. Suddenly we're class one strength because of these new technologies, but with no plastics, no VOCs, no chemicals, no nasties at all. So, so yes, I think it's uh, 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 shouting and yelling from the rooftops as much as possible. Wonderful. Well, look, uh, we've just had a question in uh, the, the list of wonderful alternatives you mentioned there, Talin. I think that will be handy to circulate. So I think we can include that when we uh, push this broadcast out, because I think people will be interested in understanding some of the detail behind that. But Jamie, I want to come to you and, and, and sort of what would I call a tackle the elephant in the room here. And, and it's this whole area of cost, because, you know, like I said, you're at the sharp edge here. You're trying to do the right thing, create a low carbon home. Uh, and, and there are cost implications, especially when some of these solutions are a bit more expensive because it's disruptive, innovative technology. So how do you balance that? And are you starting to see costs come down for some of these alternatives that you want to include in some of your new product? I think you're on mute, Jamie. So maybe just hit your microphone Sorry. there. Thanks. Uh, a lot of there's uh, especially like the renewable technologies are certainly coming down in price, like solar panels, air source heat pumps and the likes. Um, but unfortunately, as a house builder, it's a very big balancing act because uh, we're sat in the middle of everything. We're sat in the middle of design. We're sat in the middle of a, a housing crisis. We're sat in terms of what people can afford and also trying to drive uh, innovative change for the industry. Um, I think it will take a bit of time, like any industry, for example, like electric cars, uh, uh, until we start producing more and the innovators and early adopters get on board with these things, then the mass market will start to also um, buy it up as well. I, I can only speak for my particular industry, which is house building uh, residential in the UK. Um, at about, don't quote me on the exact figure, but around about 85% of all new builds built in the UK are by the big PLCs. So they won't change anytime soon because they've got a perfectly good model and they report great statistics to the City of London for shareholders. Uh, and like any other industry, it takes the innovators and disruptors to change a market uh, and uh, bring new products to it. Um, so if, if companies like, like Hassett Homes, and, and it's not just going to be us, it's going to be a number of companies which, which will have to do it. But if we, if we push change with these new house types, we would hope that the larger PLCs will follow suit and it will have a, an industry change then. But just coming to the uh, question of costs, if you do it step by step, um, we can do it where we can, we can change things slowly and not have a, a detrimental impact upon cost because at the end of the day for us as a house builder, it all boils down to affordability of buyers. Um, but with any new products, uh, typically uh, it's always more focused to maybe uh, more of a, a premium market like with any new product uh, and that's what we're aiming for because we do believe uh, our carbon zero homes will cost around about five or ten percent more to build uh, but we do believe people will pay that premium because after about four years they're back neutral again and they've got a product which will which will be energized in, in perpetuity uh, and then from there on, we hope that it will start to filter back down uh, to the rest of the smaller markets and the mass market as well. But I also think you have external catalysts for some of this behavior change with soaring energy prices and the opportunity for a product such as a low carbon home or a, a well, in, well insulated home with solar panels and thermodynamic hot water and uh, battery energy storage uh, incorporated into the design where over five, 10 years clearly pays back for itself, especially with the uncertainty around energy prices in, in the marketplace. Um, 
I, I want to come to Patrick on this question first, and, and it's to do with uh, regulation. And in, in your view, how do you think products and materials can, could be regulated given the pollution car, you know, caused by harmful chemicals such as PFAs and the VOCs that you, you mentioned uh, before? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, actually. Um, funnily enough, a week before last, I was sent an image of a, of a well-known paints brand. And on the side of it, I've got a picture of it here on my desktop, actually. It says, danger contains two butanone oxy may cause cancer. And that's actually the first time I've seen one of the big brands having to declare something that's in their paint. Uh, which is, you know, deeply toxic. I mean, there's 10,000 chemicals in the average, uh, you know, cheap commercial paint and 300 are toxic, 150 carcinogenic. So most people have no idea about that. They simply think colour, for example, in paints and, the, and they don't worry about what they're putting all over their walls. But so I think it's coming from government and, and more importantly, I think it's coming from, again, awareness, um, education, educating pe people about, the benefits of healthier products. Um, because once people realize the, the biophilic benefits, for example, in an office space of clean materials, the owner of that company is not gonna have a second thought about paying a little bit extra for the, for the more expensive, potentially more expensive um, uh, uh, products. So I think it's a combination of government intervention, forcing those companies to declare what's not so healthy, and secondly, uh, knowledge of people wanting to use healthier materials. There are examples from other sectors, though, Patrick, as well, where you have things like uh, alcohol or tobacco, where you have very clear health warnings on the outside of, of the packaging. And so there are case studies from other industries that could be easily applied to things like paints or the construction sector. Um, and I guess coming to uh, Talene now in relation to the government influence over this whole area that we're talking about, essentially the government have two levers that they can pull, taxation and regulation. And you see it in lots of different sectors where if government wants a sector to move in a certain direction, there's a price to pay if you don't move, i.e. taxation, or you could get regulated out of business. So how effective do you think so far the government is in prodding industry, the construction sector in particular, to be more mindful in relation to plastic pollution and the use of plastic uh, when thinking about taxation and regulation? Or do we have a long way to go? Um, I think they've been pretty useless. <laughs> Um, in addition to that, there was is going to be a rollback on regulation for plastics and um, PFAs and endocrine disrupting chemicals in British products after Brexit. So we're just moving backwards um, in the UK. Um, EU is doing a lot better. They have a new um, commission. They've come out with some new regulation recently uh, and they're still developing it. Uh, on the other hand, the US is incredibly far behind, even worse than anything in Europe. Um, one of the issues is that there's big oil lobby, um, plastics lobby as well, that is pushing a lot of, um, it, well, they actually sponsored a lot of studies that masked information about the hazards of these things that were then given to lawmakers that they then made decisions off of. They've also got a lot of lawmakers and regulatory officials in their pockets in the US, for example, there's an issue between people who work in regulation actually moving into the um, chemical production industry because they're, I guess, bought off by a much higher paycheck. And they're also bought off to make lower regulation or no regulation because of the money that's coming to their pocket from behind. So, I mean, it's incredibly bad. <laughs> um, so while we wait for things to improve, um, I think that we um, as architects, as designers, as contractors, manufacturers need to take responsibility um, to ensure that we're specifying the correct products, really being vigilant about what's in our content for the material content. And one big thing that I really want to see from manufacturers and supply chains is taking responsibility for looking at their actual materials in the supply chain. We have a massive issue with material transparency. And um, as an architect now, 
Alcala material manufacturer request an ingredients list. And at some cases, they're not required to divulge all of the information, even though some of that information is an endocrine disrupting chemical that has very serious health effects later on. Um, and the other people will also say, we don't know because it's too difficult to track it. So, I mean, that at this point, it's just unacceptable from all ends. So what we need to push, but also we need to be extremely vigilant. And I think you're right, Talene. You're seeing a lot of big corporates now in the UK taking a little bit more responsibility and putting in CSR and sustainability agendas and, and putting it on their, their corporate agenda effectively. So the, the, the change is coming from within rather than being foisted on them by, by government. But government will catch up at some point and taxation and regulation will have a role to play. What's the Irish perspective on this, Rachel? Um, I kind of um, echo what has been said already. Not much um, is going on. Unfortunately, it'd be great to have a tax on virgin materials, um, which would be amazing, which would push forward um, more natural materials, more local materials. Um, this, I mean, in relation to we have a big problem in our interest sourcing materials and like inflation has caused materials to skyrocket, which has been an absolute um, disaster for a lot of construction product um, projects. But in a way, it might allow people to look at what else we can use um, and look at alternative materials such as sheep's wool or hemp or, you know, stuff that grows naturally in Ireland um, to see how we can utilize that. Um, and yeah, there's, there's so much, there's so much to comment on there. Um, I feel like we don't have time to wait for the government to go through all their processes. Like we just don't, we're in a climate and ecological emergency. Like we really don't have time. We need to act now. Um, and as architects, designers, engineers, anyone in the construction industry, we have so much, um, in a way, we have a lot of power to create change. And that kind of happens on the design table. So when you're with a client, you need to discuss the impacts of these materials, the impacts on their health, the impacts on the environment, and also discuss, you know, the climate emergency that we're in being like, you know, you have, you can, you know, you can omit those tiles from your kitchen or omit that like, fancy spec for X, Y, and Z, and then look at more natural materials. It's like, um, I suppose in the circular economy, it's a very important thing to compare back. It's like, what do we actually need? You know? Um, and then you can use that extra budget because it mostly does come back to budget and finance these situations. We like, can I use extra, you know, use extra budget for specifying a uh, more ecological material? Like um, even I was at a client meeting and I was discussing paints with the client. And I, was, I brought graph and stone, like the different, um, samples of graph and stone. I had them all on the table, like all the colors. And I had the documents from graph and stone out and saying where they're coming from, talking about cradle to cradle and nature plus and all the different certifications. And the client was so excited being like, wow, I can make such an impact just on choosing the paints. And like, it was just kind of like, it was it's, I, like, I spent like an hour there discussing all this stuff with her. And she was just, yeah, she has so much energy. And I was like, this is where you make a big impact. You know, it's like, you know, the key cups and stuff will go so far, but this is a big thing you can do. And it's also just for the health of yourself, the health of your children and the health of anyone else who lives in this building after you, you know? And I suppose that's, yeah. I suppose enthusiasm is so important as well in relation to creating change. And I do think we have, um, we have a big responsibility in the construction industry interior to do that. And then through public awareness and, you know, the force will change, the government will change, you know, they'll have to because they won't get voted in if they don't show they care. So let's go. Patrick had his hand up there. Your thoughts on this? Yeah, Rachel, first of all, great little story. Thanks. That lifts, lifts the spirit. Listen. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, you know, it's downright misleading at the moment what uh, what we what we read about and what we see on, on for, you know, again, being, being in paints. I mean, the concept of low VOCs, which again is very vague what that means. It's around 30 to 50 grams a litre. So you pop off to your local DIY and you buy a five litre pot of paint. That's 150 to 250 grams of toxins, you know, in that one pot. That's not low, that's a disgrace. So what they're now bringing in is a trace VOC level. And at Graffenstein, we're less than 0.1 of 1%, which is naturally occurring VOCs. But they're, they're beginning to look more closely at it. They're beginning to give the consumer a bit more education, a bit more information, but it's got a long way to go. And just picking up on 
on uh, uh, Rachel's point there. You know, architects, uh, no question, have an enormous amount of power here. I think the struggle they have is they're so busy that they need time to be able to do the research and time not just to copy and paste the old Dulux spec mm -hmm. that they've always done and look at other ways to, 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 to achieve the same or, or better goals. And then the client as well, they're also focused on cost. So ultimately they need to know why they're, they, they should be researching, looking into using more sustainable and more healthy materials. And if they did, I think there would be a, the combination of the two, the architect and the client as a joint force, a lot of change is going to happen. Jamie, uh, you're sort of also interacting with architects, whether it's in-house or within the industry, as you uh, create new and uh, wonderful, wonderful products. Are you seeing a shift in how architects are uh, approaching this whole idea of plastic use or sustainability in their in the design work? Uh, I'd like to think the architects are 100%. Uh, are house builders? Uh, probably not. Because uh, as I was saying before, if 80% of all new builds in the UK are built by the big PLCs, they don't change their house size for 10 or 15 years. So no matter what the architects are screaming at them to change, uh, they won't change <laughs> very fast. Uh, for us, obviously, because it's at our core purpose to be sustainable, uh, we find it very easy and very enjoyable to work with our design team, especially our architects, uh, because that's our vision to, to deliver that. Uh, I suspect architects will have uh, uh, an ex a much more extremely harder time uh, to work with other house builders because uh, because they won't change. But it, if, if it's all about, um, as someone else mentioned before, educating people. Uh, and when people do become educated, uh, then hopefully more change will happen. Um, but architects are certainly a starting point to inform clients, um, maybe not so much in the house building industry, but more in terms of you know, the commercial sector or high rise buildings or individual projects. I think it can certainly have a huge impact. Talene, we've just come through and sort of coming out the back end of a global pandemic where essentially an external catalyst for change appeared very suddenly and we all changed our behavior very, very quickly, whether it was working from home, whether it was washing our hands a little bit more frequently, wearing masks, etc. So as a species, we've demonstrated an ability to change very quickly when necessary. So what catalysts do you think are required in the broader population or even just in the construction sector specifically to start to accelerate the change towards a, a more considered approach to construction and taking plastic into consideration. Um, I definitely echo Rachel's point again on education, um, but it's not just education of existing professionals uh, throughout the industry, it's also education starting in uni and in the lower um, levels of education for primary school. Um, everyone needs to be educated to be able to ask the right questions, to push for better products, to push for better options. Um, because without the education, no one will be aware of the effects and they won't know what the better options are. They won't know what to ask. Um, so that's something that's really important that I know ACAN is doing a really big push for um, Architects Climate Action Network, if anyone's not familiar with ACAN. Um, but in terms of a catalyst, I don't know. I feel like there's so much uh, kind of negative information about out there uh, that people kind of shy away because it's a bit too big of a problem that might be too far away for them to see how they can take action because they might seem too small. But there are also a lot of, there's a lot of good news out there. A lot of good people doing really great work, amazing innovations um, that are happening right now. So it's actually kind of searching out those good stories and publicizing them and letting everyone know that there is hope out there so that people can really get activated and engaged because if everyone's too afraid to act, then no one will act. I think organizations like Changing Streams do a fantastic job of trying to educate and raise the level of awareness, whether it's an event like this or just through their general partnership work with academia to raise this to people's consciousness. So let's talk a little bit about plastic waste because it is significantly impacting the environment. So 
What do you think that architects and designers and contractors and manufacturers should be doing to mitigate the risk uh, from plastic pollution in the future? So let's let's start with Patrick on this, please. Uh, yes, and one thing I could do very quickly is just share a screen with you on something. Um, it will take a second, but it's quite an interesting. Uh, here we go. I'm going to just share this screen with you. Can you see my screen here? Yes, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, which screen are you looking at? Are you, can you see this world here? The world's yeah. water we can see. Perfect. Okay, brilliant. This is from the, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. So, you know, people really know what they're talking about. And it basically shows if you stripped the world of its water, this little, this first large bubble is all the world's seawater inside one bubble. And then the next one to its right is all the liquid freshwater. And the tiny one that you can barely see just below it is the freshwater lakes and rivers. And what this tells you is that the world basically is damp, is hardly wet, uh, you know. And so I think, again, this is about education. When people start to realize that all of this volume of plastic, in the case of paints, 1.9 million tons a year is all going into that little circle there, uh, you start to, to really understand how impactful that is and why it's now precipitating down in rain all over the world, getting into people's food systems and bodies and everything else. And so, so I think there's two things. I think it's education. I think there's a real requirement as well, just harking back to the previous point on price. We need to get prices down and so to get it more mainstream, it's just a damn hard work push until you get more people, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, get, uh, taking, taking this stuff on board and using it. Eventually, it's going to come down in price. And I think price is a huge driver because most people, I'm afraid, still care about one thing, and that's price, like it or not. They care about that more than they care about ecology and sustainability. So, so those two things, price and knowledge, are key. Rachel, your thoughts on this? Um, in relation to the plastic or? Yeah, the, the plastic waste and how we address it and what steps that designers and architects can take to mitigate the risk from downstream uh, plastic pollution. Hmm. In relation to, um, I suppose it's all about specifying materials, like, you know, in relation to how we actually build buildings. I think there is a lack of time in relation to construction. We live in such a fast paced kind of capitalistic structure that like, it's like build, 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 gross domestic product, keep on growing. And, you know, we're, de we're destroying our environment and destroying ourselves, which, you know, and it's kind of, I think people need to take a big breath and say like, what are we actually doing? And start focusing on how can we look at alternative methods? Um, and the thing is like, I do have a lot of hope in relation to these things because there are so many different alternatives to plastic. And even in relation to like using the plastic, what that, sorry, I'm kind of um, in awe of that <laughs> um, graphic you just showed there about the water, because it's so, it's such an amazing um, image. And just thinking about all the plastics in the ocean, like, you know, the way, how could we, how can we use the plastic that exists as well to maybe like take it out of the ocean and to, you know, stop it harming people's health and stop it harming the environment. And, you know, there's a way to make bricks out of recycled plastic. There's a way to make materials out of recycled plastic. And the fear with that, the fear of that would be that we're, you know, keep on encouraging plastic to be created rather than just like halting it. We can't just haul plastic straight away. It's not going to happen. So it's like, how can we try to use what exists in relation to the plastic industry? Um, and we, yeah, I suppose maybe, yeah, looking at countries that maybe could just, you know, we could build houses just out of um, recycled plastic bricks, maybe. Um, or elements such as that. So, Talene, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Thank uh, Talene, I saw a very interesting uh, definition of the circular economy recently, and it was actually from McKinsey, and it was to run a company like a forest, so a living, breathing entity that uh, uses everything and wastes nothing. What are your thoughts on that and how you get that type of thinking embedded in uh, design and architecture in, in the future? Um, well, I think that means we, again, what Rachel said, don't specify plastic. <laughs> we need to reduce demand. Um, oh, unfortunately, we already have a lot of 
um, hazardous materials, including plastics and also other materials as well, um, in circulation at the moment. So we need to handle those. Um, how can we immobilize them so that they're not harming us? Basically, anything inside of the air barrier is going to have of, of a building's air barrier is going to have a direct health and well-being impact on the occupants. And then beyond that, at the end of life uh, or future lives of the building products, et cetera, um, will have an environmental impact on yeah, the larger environment obviously um, could be introduced to waterways and then back into human systems. Um, so if we're going to actually have this lovely utopian uh, description of circularity that McKinsey has provided, um, we need to really look to regenerative architecture, regenerative systems. We need to move away from uh, products and plastics and these things that we can't recycle without harming ourselves uh, and the environment, but also look specifically to um, bio-based products and move away from those things so that we anything that's created because we need to create something new um, to support a growing population is then able to be returned back to the earth and then support the regeneration, uh, continuous regeneration, as well as good health and well-being, good communities, all those things, and support the economy at the same time. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in general. There is. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm conscious of our time, folks. We have about 10 minutes left or so. Um, and there are lots of architects and designers uh, in our live audience today, and many more will see this show when it goes out to our global syndication partners. So what is your single ask uh, to anyone watching who routinely uses plastic in their day-to-day -day design practice? And maybe let me start with Rachel on this question. I would say to question why you're doing it and to kind of put into the context of the climate and ecological emergency. Um, we really need to put, I think, everything into context. That's, that is the main, it's the biggest issue of our time, you know, so we really need to put that in the forefront of our minds when we're doing anything. Um, and that's what I ask to just to step back and say, is this, you know, is this good for my children, for my grandchildren? Um, is this good for the human, you know, everything? You know, I think that's just, it's so important to question it and to focus on biological materials, materials that go back to the earth and to just, yeah, start educating yourself and bring awareness to it. Um, there's a great book called, um, the Handbook to Building a Circular Economy by David Acom, and which is kind of a Bible to the circular economy. It talks about biological materials and different alternatives and case studies. Um, so I'd highly recommend reading that um, as a foundation um, for your education. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd leave you with. Patrick, same question to you. Your ask of the designers and architects who are using plastic in their day-to-day yeah, work. a really interesting question, John. I've, I've written down three things here. First of all, is to care, because obviously that's the, the really, you know, the driver, isn't it? If you really care passionately about something, you'll then drive it through. Uh, secondly, to, to find the time to research alternatives. And thir thirdly, to, to encourage the client, the person that's ultimately paying for it, to see it through to the end. And that's past the QS, past the value engineering, uh, see the bigger picture, uh, and uh, those are the three things that, that would be my that would be my asks. Very good. Your asks, Jamie. Um, I would suggest uh, each individual takes responsibility. Um, even though you know it might be a small step, uh, the compound effect is uh, adding everything together. It make a big impact at the end. So if we all take responsibility, uh, and I think uh, for design teams and architects to be uh, firm in their approach as well. If they strongly believe in something, uh, try and get the clients on board and, and push it. I have a very strong uh, architect who uh, doesn't back down much on things uh, and uh, they typically win or there's a nice balance between the two. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, in terms of being strong and pushing forward your beliefs uh, and we'll get there in the end. Uh, but as, as, a, as a whole, if there's products that we can't recycle uh, or there's products that uh, do harm to the planet, then I think they should be removed uh, entirely. Um, I know that's easier said than done, but if we do bit by bit uh, in steps, then we'll eventually get there. Talene, same question to you. Your ask of the 
designers and architects watching this show? I would engage in some systems thinking, and I think that will help bring about a lot of the um, asks that Patrick and everyone else has mentioned. Um, if you're understanding that everything is connected, that our, your decision here today will impact the future and has ripple effects throughout the larger system of which we're all a part, then hopefully you'll see the need and the reason and, and why we should all be making better choices. And then to use that to encourage other people to make the same good choices. Very good. Uh, I'll draw your attention, everybody, to the chat. There are some very interesting articles being uh, suggested. Neil Maxwell posted something uh, in relation to the cost of plastic recycling and how that will impact the recycling market. Uh, there's some upcoming events that Debbie has posted that may be of interest to people. One on the 28th of April, uh, Zap Project which is zero avoidable packaging waste in construction that could be worth checking out. So please do have a look at the chat function. So uh, I'm conscious of our time. Our last question for today, uh, folks, and I'll go to Rachel first on this one. What is your boldest prediction for the future use of plastic in the construction sector? Um, I hope it's not used anymore. I hope that we transition to just using biological materials, um, which is 100% possible and it's been proven that we can do it. So why not start now? Talene, your boldest prediction. I agree. We need to completely remove plastics from our buildings. Patrick? Uh, I, ha I have to be a little bit more apocalyptic than that. I think that most likely it will continue to rise. I think they're expecting plastics production to double again in the next 20 years or something. So, you know, the world is hooked on plastic. You know, this, uh, uh, this uh, single use plastic thing drives everybody crazy. The amount of waste you throw out every week is just nuts. Um, so I think it'll increase. I think uh, that people will wake up when it's so serious out there but, uh, you know, they'll have to take action. Governments will be taking action. It's moving in that direction anyway. It's going to happen uh, sooner or later. So ultimately, it will go away. I just fear it's not going to be quick enough. Mm. Jamie, your boldest prediction? Uh, boldest prediction would be uh, I, uh, that we reduce it as far as possible, uh, but I don't believe we can get rid of it completely uh, anytime soon. Uh, we can all be optimists. Uh, I'm a realist, by the way. Uh, but I think it will still stay in things like sealants and uh, small items like that. But if we can get rid of the majority of it by swapping out with other products, uh, and then, you know, other types of products that are, are not quite sustainable, like steel, if we can get an industry which has an equilibrium in terms of we're not actually mining raw material, virgin materials, and we can recycle those materials, then I think that is probably a balanced outcome over the next 10 to 20 years. Mm. Very good. Well, we have a couple of minutes left, and I just wanted to ask maybe one additional question. Talene, a couple of years ago, plastic was material of the year in London Design Week. And I think for some good reasons, because they were talking about focusing on it as a recycled material. So bringing it back into use, recycling it and a little bit of the, the circular economy principles. What are your thoughts on that? Is that good when it's uh, put on a pedestal like that or is it not so good? Yeah, I just, I don't think it's a good idea um, <laughs> because one of the issues and I'm kind of paraphrasing a bit from a podcast that was a lovely podcast by a green chemist um, from the US. So apologies if it's not the correct, fully correct, but um, what he was saying is that if we are recycling plastics and one of parts of the plastic mixture contains toxics in it, then if we're then recycling and creating new products, we're creating even more toxic chemicals because then you've now um, put that toxic material into the rest of your mixture. And I don't like, I would like to just remove it from anything that humans touch um, because if we're touching it, if we're surrounded by it, it's affecting our health and well-being. Um, and just in the, the smallest amount, um, 
like these hazardous chemicals can have a massive impact on your health well-being um, through disrupting your hormones. So even if it's not even a factor of how much are you exposed to, the smallest amount of it can have a really detrimental effect. And so I just don't think that we should be encouraging it if we can at all remove it. Rachel, your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I definitely think we should remove plastic and that. Um, I suppose, I mean, not honor it now to create the new plastic, but we can respect the plastic that exists. Um, this is created from fossil fuels, which are obviously destroying the environment for millions of years old. Like we should respect these materials and we should reuse them and see what we can do with them. So we should halt the production of plastic now and see what we can do in relation to taking out the oceans and to you know, see if we can bring them into the circular economy in a way. Um, so that would be something that I think would be a good, an interesting thing to look at, discover and progress with. But um, echoing what Taylor said there about the, the health, you know, the, the, in fact, your health so badly and, you know, plastic is now found in people's blood. Like it's, it's really gone too far, you know? So we really need to, to stop. I think we'll start to hear more and more terminology changes as well with microplastics, plastics and macroplastics and the effects and impacts of all of those in supply chains and in the environment. But I think our time is up now, uh, folks. So Talene, Rachel, Jamie, Patrick, thank you so much for joining us today and for your helpful and very considered inputs and insights. Lots to consider from our discussion, I think. And we talked about education, we talked about awareness, we talked about essentially everybody doing their own little bit in their specific area of practice and expertise. And it's a team effort. And with help from governments and regulators who may be watching this, they can help too in terms of encouraging people to be more conscientious about the choices that they make. And they have uh, tools and manners in which they can encourage people to do that more quickly. So ladies and gentlemen, this has been conversations with changing streams my name is john fitzgerald thank you all for watching all the best for now